Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back. So in this video, we're going to get a little bit complicated with what we need to do with our application and we're probably going to have to make some changes. One of the hard parts of, of dealing with a micro framework is that it's not opinionated on how you do anything, including authentication and session management and some of the more complicated aspects of, of web programming. Some of the problems with dealing with authentication is you know, storing and encrypting passwords, uh, just to name you know one complicated feature. And there is something out there that a lot of people were using called Flask Login, which is great, but it's completely un unopinionated in how you actually implement your logic, like setting up your user tables, um, trying to make you know maintain like what a particular user's status is, because every website has a different different idea on whether or not you know one of their users is active some people uh, some websites allow cookies and stuff like that for authentication um, some allow people to authenticate through like OAuth and other tools um, through third parties and everything so you could go down you know and, and pave your own way with something like flask login which definitely does a lot if you didn't have a, a helpful plugin like this but we're actually going to take it a step further and um, use a project called Flask Security. And from what I've seen, I've actually never used this project, so this is going to be my first time of trying to implement this. Um, so I'm sure I'll make a few mistakes along the way in this video, but uh, we just want to go ahead and, and get this installed and see if we can get it running. And it looks like a very healthy project. If we look at GitHub, there's over 57 contributors, 700, uh, 702 commits, including as recent as uh, last month. So that's always a good sign when a project has a lot of support like that. And hopefully with this video and, and more Flask websites out there that you know they'll be able to get even more support uh, on GitHub. Now you can actually see a few of the requirements for this, uh, this to work is it's going to have to have all of this stuff right here, but then you can also see it needs to actually use some sort of object relational mapper. So if you've been following along in this video, we already have uh, Flask SQL Alchemy already installed and uh, in working, so we should be pretty good with all of the uh, the necessary dependencies. So things are going to get ugly with the existing code base in order to get this thing working. And actually, once we make the changes to this, I'm going to go ahead and uh, post it up to GitHub, so that way we have uh, differentiating code between what we're about to do now compared to what we had before. So we're going to have to get rid of things like our database table. And we're going to use the one that's actually recommended for Flask security. And if we go to the website here, you can actually get a copy of the, the code that we're going to be trying to implement, which is located at this URL. So first things first, we need to go ahead and install Flask security. So go to our command line, and then we're going to run pip install Flask security, and then it wants to install Flask SQL Alchemy, but we already have that, so let's go ahead and just do Flask Security. And you can see it says building wheels for collected packages like security, Flask login, uh, Flask mail, Flask principal, Flask WTF, which is like a forms handler. So it's all kinds of projects that are built around Flask that this thing needed because it is opinionated, which is good because we don't want to have to reinvent uh, or reinvent the wheel here. So it went ahead and installed all these dependencies. So we should be good to go now. Let's go ahead and import the necessary things that we'll, we'll need from this new library. So underneath the render template import statements that we have, let's go ahead and paste this in from flask.extension security, import security, SQL Alchemy user data store. We definitely don't need that, that forward slash there. So I'll just keep it all on one line. I don't really care about that. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and get rid of this entire user class here. This is our old database model. So we're going to get rid of all that. 
and we're going to paste in from the website all of this content and I'll provide the link to this application that we're actually building in the description so you guys can obviously copy and paste that or you can pause the video and have to write all that crap in uh, or just go to github and, and grab the latest all right so under that we're going to go ahead and set up our flash security and then we're also going to add a piece of code that's going to be executed just one time and you can see it's given a um, decorator. That's what these at symbols are. They're considered decorators. They're basically just wrappers around Python functions so that they get executed before the actual function. And this thing actually says app.before first request. So this will only run one time when we fire up the server. And I'm going to go ahead and just put So we'll just put a um, helpful email with a password and now the one issue that we have is that in Postgres we already have a user table so we're gonna have a conflicting user table that tries to get created so we want to make sure we go ahead and go into our database and delete our table and we can just say delete or drop and now we have zero tables inside of our database again Alright, so we made a lot of changes. We're going to go ahead and try to fire up the server and see if we've run into any problems. And we are running, so that's a good sign. Let's take a look at the database and see if anything got written to it. So it might actually be where we have to go to the page in question for this thing to trigger. Yeah, there's definitely not going to be a username in our profile page anymore. But by going to that page and refreshing it, it triggered this wrapper function that we had decorated before first request to fire. So if we went back to our database, you can see that we now have the three tables that it created for us, uh, role, role users, and user. So that's all good. Let's go ahead and clean up the index function since it's trying to reference uh, stuff that isn't there anymore like this username. In fact, we can just simply change that to something that is there. Like uh, it, we have, instead of username, we go by email. And that's usually a good idea. A lot of sites have just, you know, register, like log in with your email address. That, that way it's unique and people don't forget it. So, you know, I could say email, right? So go down here. I'm not going to grab all users. We'll get rid of that. In fact, we'll get rid of all this crap. Don't even worry about it because that's not going to be in the index function. It's not a good place for it. So let's get rid of all of that. And then inside of our template for, where is that template at? We're going to get rid of all these template tags. All right, guys, so there's a first thing, there's a few things that we need to do. Uh, number one, let's get rid of this entire method that says uh, app before first request because we don't want that trying to be executed uh, multiple times since it would try to put duplicate records in the database, which would throw an, an error. We made sure that the email is unique, as you can see here. That way um, you're not going to have multiple people with the same email address registered to the site. And... Flask security actually comes with a lot of forms and everything that we need, which is really helpful for like logging in, registering, forgetting password, and doing all that other stuff. But there's a few things that we need to add to our configuration in order for that to take place. Number one, they they handle security for us um, by using CSR protection, which is called cross site forgery, and that's actually one of the major forms of, of attacks that happen, um, which is consider cross-site scripting or XSS um, and this will actually handle the security mechanisms for you now you're gonna set a secret key and you probably want to make it some long weird thing that's that's you know meaningful to you but we're just gonna have 
you know, the default super secret since everything is exposed on this website. It's just all running locally. It's not on a production server somewhere, but your secret key has to be set and that's for CSRF uh, security to work. And then the next thing you need to do, um, let me see. So I think we should be ready to just go ahead and restart the server now. And we should be able to navigate over to like register. Oh, you know what? We're missing one extra, extra step. I thought we were one second. We need to set one more config underneath of our secret key. And it's security registerable equal true. And that's actually going to use the default forms that are available inside Flask, um, Flask security. So let's restart this one more time. And you can see we now have the register form. So as you can see, this already has a login form and all that stuff. So that's that's helpful that we don't have to actually create these views. They still look like crap because we don't have anything you know, decorating them or anything like that. But we'll get to that in the future. Now let's go ahead and try to log in with the user that was created when we initiated. Oh, what the hell did I just hit? Um, when we just created the user. Uh, so let's go over to... We created these uh, tables. If you remember, we did actually create an object, and I, I gave it like uh, my email address. I think test one two three, and let's go ahead and just say, yeah, there it is. Okay, so that's the email, and then test one two three. Sweet, and we can save it. And by default, it's going to re, um, redirect to the root directory, which really looks silly because we have a form as our root directory. In the next video, we'll go ahead and try to clean that up a bit. But we now have working a working website. So in the following videos, we're going to look at how to... Well, I'll do this in the next video. We're going to adapt this profile page to, number one, make sure that the person is logged in in order to be able to view it, and then also be able to pass in the data just like we did in the last video. And we'll go ahead and we'll display everything the, the way we were. So we'll have to update the username to actually query by uh, email address instead. I think that would be the best way to do it. We could do by ID of the user, but um, I'll figure that out when we get to the next video. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Have a good night. Bye.